sometimes I've noticed with smaller diameter bullets being pushed really fast, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't always hear the impact on the game. Oh, okay. And you guys have probably shot enough that if you shoot a 338 uh, bullet or even a 30 cal, sometimes you hear it just flop the side of the animal. You don't always hear that depending on what cartridge and caliber you're using. So again, you can't judge one effect, your one impact uh, or one, one sound or one sight can't always be the indicator for how well, you know, your shot did. What's up, everybody? We've got a good one for you here today. One that's coming via some requests that we've gotten. So again, keep throwing those requests out there. We're trying to get to them all. Uh, and then also our own curiosity. So Mark and I sit with Jason Nash across the table from us, virtually from Federal Ammunition. And we've discussed, boy, in our podcast, we've talked about the actual rifle itself, we've talked about um, ammunition, which we're going to get into here a lot more, uh, scopes, optics, we've talked about how bullets fly through the air, we've talked about wild game, some cooking, and the thing Tons is, Tons of though, different cartridges. Well, lots of different cartridges. You got to realize, though, I've, in all of that, there's a very important part of the process that happens, especially in hunting. We're going to refer to a lot of the, uh, in re in relation to... Uh, hunting in this podcast because there's a very important part of the process that happens after you've figured out the rifle setup, after you've done the ballistics, shot the shot, the bullet's flown through the air, before you can start cutting up that deer or whatever it's going to be, it has to hit it. And there's terminal ballistics that occurs there. And uh, it has to be effective at what it does because obviously a lot of us, uh, all of us here, I, I certainly hope, but I'm just going to assume all of us, I like to fancy ourselves ethical hunters, right? So you you put an ethical shot on game, you do it with the right ammunition in the right way that hopefully puts it down um, as soon as possible. So anyway, that's why we've got Jason here, and hopefully we're going to spit out some good questions, some related to the suggestions that you've given us, uh, and then you know he's got tons of good information that will explain that more, I think. Yeah. Um, help you make maybe a more informed decision when you go out and buy ammo for hunting season and figure out what you're going to use in various different situations. Cause it's not always the same ammo that you, you, you can't just pick, you know, if I shoot 308, right? Yeah. I don't know why I picked such a antiquated, An antiquated cart cartridge. cartridge, but if I shoot 308, I can't necessarily just say necessarily, you know, this one loading with this one bullet of 308 is the, is the loading I use for everything across the board. Maybe some people do that. Maybe it works. I don't know. I think that's probably what we're going to talk about. Um, Jason, I've talked enough, though. Let's have you introduce yourself, though. Uh, what do you do over at Federal, and uh, what do you think of terminal ballistics? Well, obviously a subject that's really close to, to me, and uh, you know, I've spent a lot of years here at Federal. I'm on, I've been here 17 years in the marketing department. I'm now the, the head of marketing for Federal and a couple of our sister brands of ammunition, so... I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of time in the field through, through my job and through my personal interests to test out a lot of different bullets. And I, I try to do that you know, as often as I can. I try to test a new cartridge, test a new bullet style so that I can get some of that real experience with it. And um, but like you said, Jim, it, it's true. There's not necessarily a single right load for, for every application, for every gun, for every every um, situation. So you do have to mix it up and be open-minded and, you know, see what works the best for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and there's, there's so many different bullet offerings out there uh, and they, and they do different things and people, people, I guess, uh, like different things about different bullets. Like, Oh man, I want something that's going to drive and break bone. And another person says, no, I want something that's going to maybe, you know, expand rapidly and I want to dump all that energy and I don't even care if I get an exit wound. And some, and so, the, and bullets do different things. They're constructed different ways. I know I was on your website. Well, I've been on your website a ton of times but earlier today and just the, the vast array of, you know, cartridges and, and, and bullet offerings and combinations. I mean, it's really, um, and I could even say, not that this is necessarily a, a podcast geared towards like a person just getting into hunting, but man, I could see that being paralyzing. I mean, there's a lot of different choices out there. Mm -hmm. um, 
maybe Jason, maybe if a little bit, can you define, you know, what, what terminal ballistics, you know, means to you? And maybe even we can go into essentially how a bullet is killing that am- animal. And one thing I'll even point out there too, if you're brand new to this and you think that it's only you who walks into the ammo section and looks at all the different bullet availabilities and different loadings and all that and is like, oh man, it's not only you as a newer uh, hunter or shooter because... Oh, I mean, this is a topic of conversation is, around here all the time. I think it's even ongoing if you've been hunting for a really long time because new bullets come out on the market. We, we'll talk about one that I know Jason was just talking about as well um, that's come out fairly recently for Federal. But, I mean, Ryan Muckenhorn, the guy who's talking about cartridges all the time on the podcast, even he's going and waffling back and forth sometimes like, well, I've been using this bullet for a long time, but now I'm starting to think... This other one that I poo-hooed for so long actually is better. And, I mean, he doesn't even seem to have it down yet. You know, I don't I don't really know many people that are like, yep, that one's good for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, for sure. For anyway, sure. but sorry. carry on, Jason. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a great point. And it's part of what we thrive on, right, is is debating what's a better cartridge, what's a better bullet. Cause, and there's, there's so many different degrees. I mean, they're really small degrees of difference between each cartridge. You guys, I know have talked a lot about the six, five craze and all the different variants of six, five, and they're all the cartridges that are built on a, a 308 case. And, you know, it, it, it's fun. And, and as you know, enthusiasts, people like to tinker around and, and see what works best. And, you know, the federal, you know, started a long time ago with, in the 1970s, we were the first company to come out with what we called federal premium, which were where we said, you know what, we're going to take the best bullets that people use for reloading. We're going to put them in a factory ammunition and that product's going to shoot as well as your own hand loads. So that was really where federal's centerfire rifle premium line started. And it was with a nozzle partition and a Sierra game King. Mm-hmm. And, and so what we, you know, if you don't know the story behind the Nosler partition, you guys probably do. You know, it was um, John Nosler's attempt at trying to make a better bullet um, for game because he had a couple of bullets fail on on Moose. And, and so he went back to the drawing board and said, how can I make a bullet that's going to perform better if my shot's not perfect? And that's where our, our philosophy is really two things. One offer as many choices as anyone would want. Like Mark, you saw on our, our website in our catalog, we like to offer as many options as possible for people who happen to like certain types of bullet construction. And then our, our typical, but if you ask anybody who works here, we're usually going to tell you that higher weight retention kills better. You know, when we talk about terminal ballistics, we talk about what's going to do a better job of effectively transferring energy to the animal and creating enough of a enough trauma to to kill then typically we go with higher weight retention okay Mm -hmm. and that's referring to basically um i mean it's so it's so interesting to talk about (laughs) we've had so many podcasts talking about bullet performance flying through the air that now we're talking about bullet performance as it makes the impact which is just that's a whole nother level of i mean bullet engineering i mean just making a bullet fly through the air well is only half the story. Um, but when you're talking about weight retention, that's essentially upon impact. There are certain bullets that are designed essentially to kind of explode or something. I mean, I don't know if that's even the right word, but it maybe explode. Sometimes it's used in like, a, like it has a negative. In, like there's an explosion. No, but, you know, not like an incendiary. Expand <laughs> rapidly, <laughs> potentially even come apart. Like, you know, people talk about, um, ballistic tip, you know, sure. ammunition a lot. And actually, that's one thing that I, I I hear people sometimes interchangeably, they'll say ballistic tip, but they're really just talking about a polymer tip. But I think a ballistic tip is different than just a polymer tip bullet. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but. Well, you know, Nosler, again, kind of coined that ballistic tip. You know, that was their trademark. They came out with the first tip bullet, and it was designed really to come apart. You know, is mm-hmm. designed to, that tip initiates greater expansion. You know, most bullets operate if you have a hollow point, it's working on hydraulics. So as, mm-hmm. as the fluid comes into that hollow point, it peels the bullet back, makes it upset, makes it mushroom. And um, when that tip is in there, it's more of a mechanical. Um, when when the bullet hits, it's 
the actual tip is pushing back and starting that that expansion. Sure. Okay. And it tends yeah. to be a little bit more violent, uh, especially if you've got a light constructed bullet like a thinner jacket on top of a lead core. Um, it's definitely going to come apart. And people love it for a lot of people shoot deer with ballistic tips. Um, a lot of people love it for for varmints, you know, prairie dogs. And if you're hunting for hides, yep. like coyotes, it just puts one hole in, comes apart, and you you don't have two holes in your hide. So, yeah, and it, again, but you're right. Ballistic tips have kind of come a long way since that initial design. Mm-hmm. You know, now they're more for higher BC. They're for initiating expansion at long range. Um, you'll see really bonded bullets that have those ballistic tips too. So it's not just on those designed to come apart. So mm-hmm. is that still, so is that, because I always like, personally, like I mentally differentiate like a ballistic tip bullet as like, Yes, it has like a, you know, some sort of polymer tip to it, but yeah. it's designed to, like you said, it's got that thinner jacket, it comes apart. And then I, to me, I'm just like, I look at maybe like a, uh, uh, you know, just like, you know, uh, like say a bonded bullet, right? That's designed for high weight retention, um, good expansion, but it still has that polymer tip on it. So would that still be called a ballistic tip though? Or is it called a, just a polymer tip bullet? It's it's a polymer tip or a polycarbonate tip. I mean... Um, Nosler actually does have a trademark on ballistic tip. As oh, okay. a name. So, you know, it's almost like Kleenex. They came out with it first and that's what people call any, any. Yeah. Tip okay. Them. Got it. But, but that's their product line. Interesting. Hmm. And so then Mark, you've brought up a couple of, uh, you brought up a couple of points or vocabulary words or something, man. I just sounded, <laughs> <laughs> just sounded like I don't even know the English language there for a second, but, um, you brought up a, a few points there. Like, um, bonded bullets and then you know there's some bullets with the thinner jackets which i would generally assume to be like a cup and core style right where you have a core of lead with a thin copper jacket around it correct and so and then the bonded bullet is more of just like a solid copper construction well or am i off on that let's yeah let's talk about all that stuff i was was gonna say um Maybe circling back. Let's circle back for a minute because I want to talk right. about. All right. I just, I just we'll want, go in your order, Mark. Yeah. I just because I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact. I feel like there's uh, so many questions about this. So many questions, and I've. Uh, but I, I want to go back to just you know when we're talking about maybe defining terminal ballistics and how that and how that bullet is actually, you know, essentially killing or dispatching the animal. Like w- what is happening? I guess in some ways, no matter the bullet, like what's happening once that bullet impacts um, and, and is essentially, you know, transferring that energy or passing through the animal, what, what, what is going on there, Jason? Well, it's, you know, and the reason you don't use a full metal jacket for hunting is because it zips right through. And even if you hit the vitals and, you know, it does a lot of damage and will eventually kill, you want, you want expansion. So okay. controlled expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most part on big game animals, you know, if violent expansion on, on smaller things, or if you're trying to preserve the hide, um, you know, it's a different story, but you know, that's, so our engineers spend a ton of time working on that ideal amount of expansion that gives you that perfect, like catalog looking, uh, upset that you'll see, yep. um, sometimes pulling out of the game. Sure. So what happens is, yeah, that, that expansion transfers the energy inside and disrupts, um, their vital zone creates a great deal of trauma instead of creating a, a small pinhole through the entire animal of trauma that's maybe you know whatever diameter the bullet is th- or mm-hmm. around you've created this channel of trauma that's much greater in diameter than just the the diameter of the round itself yeah and then you like and you're hopefully hitting all kinds of vitals to then really put it down quickly yeah, and the way I understand it, you kind of have the uh, you have the uh, the permanent, and then like the temporary, um, you know, cavitation that happens. So like the permanent would be like kind of more that diameter of the bullet as it passes through the animal, animal, the aminal. Uh, now I'm having to practice my words, Jim. Uh, but uh, and then you also have uh, the temporary, where like you get kind of like that that energy upset, where. It's transferring that energy, like I guess, outside of that permanent wound channel, and still doing a ton of damage to, um, you know, 
organs and and really you know everything else that that's going on there um would that be pretty accurate jason yeah that's a good summary and that's why you'll see us you know it's tough to be at like an event and and show off ammunition right especially if it's indoors um without actually shooting it on game to demonstrate what that bullet does inside an animal we use ballistic gelatin mm-hmm. so you'll see videos of you know some friends of ours call them jello jigglers shooting these gelatin blocks and and you'll see that kind of violent you know reaction and you can see inside where there's that temporary cavity and then when it comes back the permanent cavity and yeah it's that's exactly it it's all about transferring that energy and and creating as much trauma as possible. I mean, it's pretty wild stuff to watch. I know when I've watched that in slow motion, uh, particularly, you know, you can watch those two things kind of happen, and, mm-hmm. um, and it makes you, you're like, huh, that's how it works. And then, like you said, Jason, you know, every now and again, I tend to gravitate towards that bullet style that you're talking about, like, you know, heavier weight, heavier weight retention, you know, like, you know, a good bonded bullet or something like that. Um, but every now and again, you'll recover one and you really, you look, you pull it out, you go, man, that, I mean, that is, it, it worked. It's just like the pictures. Yeah. It's all, it's always impressive that it can, something so small, moving so fast, hitting something potentially so hard that it stops it. And yet it's still, Looks, I mean, like you said, like, you know, nearly 100% weight retention, you know, mushrooms perfect or the, or the petals essentially peel back perfectly, if you will, on some different style bullets. Um, it's pretty neat. I, I, don't, I don't know how you guys do it. How do you guys do it? <laughs> we have really smart engineers who've spent years and years of, uh, you know, trial and error figuring it out and taking the best pieces of, of each bullet. And we have the benefit of having a lot of different offerings out there. And, um, you know, we load them all, which means we test them all, we shoot them all, and we're able to kind of see what works best from each of those bullets and and bring those together. And I think the other other thing that we really harp on about bonded bullets and high weight retention is that it gives you a little bit more forgiveness. If you've got a bullet that hits the shoulder Mm -hmm. and doesn't have enough uh, strength to it to go through and get to the vitals, then you're not going to make a clean shot. So, you know, we, we've all been out there. I mean, animals don't always stand still for you, right? Mm-hmm. They're moving, they're, they're walking, there's wind, there's your nerves. Um, there are a lot of factors that come into play. And if you don't make an exactly perfect shot, having a bullet that'll go through bone or will come in at an angle and still penetrate deep enough is going to give you a little bit more forgiveness um, on the shot. Yeah, for sure. And I think you nailed a big one there that that's always on my mind. You know, I mean, a lot of bullets are going to perform really great on like a perfectly broadside shot. You tuck it right into the pocket, you know, just, you know, lungs or whatever. You don't hit any shoulders and boom, off you go. But um, like you said, you're going to get uh, animals are moving. You get different angles. You might have a hard quartering two shot where you need to punch it through that front shoulder. And, and uh, you know, hopefully that bullet's going to hit that, break that shoulder and drive through the animal. And and I guess, you know, on the reverse, and I guess this is a situation that, that I was in one time. I didn't intentionally do it, but I had a hard quartering shot. It wasn't that far of a shot. It was probably about 100 yards as an offhand shot. And I was actually trying to slip it through kind of like that, that last rib area and then towards the offside shoulder. Well, I ended up pulling the shot a little bit back, so I actually hit it. Um, in in the back left hand, but that bullet it was it was a monolithic style bullet. It quartered through that back hand, broke that bone, through the uh, quartered through the entire animal, and stopped actually just um, the angle was right. Essentially, it stopped just uh, inside the hide, uh, right behind the offside shoulder. And uh, actually, Jason, it was it was one of the load offerings that that you guys uh, make, and. Uh, uh, out of a 270 and mushroomed, per, I mean, it went through, broke that giant bone at, at close range, mind you, you know, we're talking about a hundred yards. So you got basically, you know, all your velocity right there and, and passed through, broke that big bone, passed through that entire animal, perfectly expanded. I'd assume it actually had a nearly hundred percent weight retention. I saved it, Jim. I, I have it. I had it at my desk at, at, at old vortex, what I call or, old vortex. Oh, this is a while back. I was wondering, I was, yeah. the whole time that you were talking, I was thinking, Mark is a two seventy. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> when we moved, 
I was like, ooh, I need to save this. And I was in a hurry. And so I, I, I set it on the, uh, the floor mat of, uh, of, of my backseat of my pickup. Not a great spot for it. And uh, I was vacuuming my truck at, at the uh, car wash uh, a couple days later. And I heard it rattle down the pipe, and I was like, immediately, I was like, oh, man, I know what that was, and I'm not getting it back. So it's a, it's a souvenir that uh, is apparent. It's, uh, it's gone now, Jim. It's probably returned to the, to the earth somewhere. It returned to the, the, the earth. But the important thing is that it worked perfectly, and I guess it illustrates that situation where, like I said, shots aren't always going to be perfect, and you want to pick a bullet that's going to maybe a- accommodate those, those imperfections. Yeah. Now let's, so I want to talk about that. Mark, I'm going to bring up bullet construction again. Let's even do though it. You, that's what we're talking about. Even though you about. shot Swatter Supreme me earlier. Okay. Um, but I'm going to... So, okay. You've talked about bonded bullets. It's like a solid projectile, right? Well, and, I don't think they're solid. Well, okay. So, explain. That's what I wanted Jason to do. Hold, can you just give me a second here? Okay. All right. So, it's <laughs> not a thin jacket around a lead core. Can we agree on that? At least I, we'll have... I don't know. All right. Well, I, All right. Well, anyway... All I'm trying to get at is that I've heard people discuss, people argue bonded bullets versus cup and core bullets all the time, right? And so, uh, you know, people will say, well, at shorter ranges, which a lot of us find ourselves shooting deer at, especially I know us folks up here in Wisconsin and the Midwest region, we are, at the time of this recording at least, coming up on deer season here, gun deer season. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are traditionally going to be taking shots somewhere within 100 yards, probably. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have heard, at least, where you've got some of these bullets, and and we'll we'll get into how they're made and all that, but there's some bullets where if you shoot them at shorter ranges, they're going so fast and, you know, they're going to hit the animals so hard that they're more likely to come apart and not actually do what they're supposed to do at the right time. It might happen too soon. You might not actually get uh, full performance of the bullet happening where you want it to happen inside of the, uh, inside of the deer's body, you know, and, and that might be a case where you get, uh, usually I hear like these monolithic bullets that would then punch through or something along those lines. But then at longer distances, if you're a Western hunter, for example, there are situations where you've shot the bullets had time in air, it's losing some velocity. It needs a little bit of assistance in expanding and stuff like that by having that thinner jacket, I mean, this is all this is all stuff I've heard, and, and I'm by no means a professional. I probably sound like an idiot going through explaining some of this stuff, but I think that's that's where this is hopefully going to be helpful for other people like that who also aren't sure. Um, so, what are what are the differences? Like, what are these different bullet types that people are talking about? How are they constructed, and how do they come into play with your different applications that people find themselves in? Yeah, that, that was actually a good. I mean, that's exactly. It. I mean, that's the challenge, the design challenge that our team looks at every day is how do you come up with the perfect for hunting? How do you come up with the perfect balance of weight retention when when you're up close and that and the most damage is being done to that bullet uh, because of the velocity and the energy? And then how do you still make it expand at long range? And we've we've got a new product that that does that. But in terms of construction, yeah, there's the cup and core, which uh, and um a lot of match bullets are made that way because they don't have to have that controlled expansion and you tend to be able to get higher BCs and uh, more consistent jacket thickness um, Hmm. with those more traditional uh, methods. And then there's a bonded bullet and they range from um, Nosler's AccuBond, which is about 60 to 65% weight retention typically. And then you've got our, um, there's a Swift Scirocco we started to load that has a thicker jacket. It's got a similar design, you know, it's a lead core with a bonded copper jacket on it, but it's a thicker copper jacket than an Acubon, so you get a little higher weight retention. Hmm. And then we've got our trophy bonded bear claw, which has been the basis of a lot of our recent bullet uh, introductions, edge and terminal ascent, that has a solid copper shank, and it has just a little bit of lead in the front of the bullet so that you know, it gets good expansion, but that then expansion stops at that shank. So mm-hmm. you've always got that solid copper shank, um, if nothing else, to go through the animal. Okay. And then there's monolithic. You guys have talked about monolithic, which is, an, you know, a single alloy. Um, all copper typically is the okay. construction of this bullet. It's like a Barnes triple shock, our own trophy copper. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's actually where part of the thing that I was getting comp- confused is I've heard people throw out, 
monolithic and then bonded and all that stuff. And I never, I guess I didn't realize that they were even talking about separate things. I thought that was kind of all one thing, but okay, got it. What what would make a person choose, I guess, one over the other? You know, we're talking a little bit about, um, you know, maybe close range, you know, versus long range. You know, I mean, in Wisconsin, you don't really need to, by and large, you know, be like, oh, my gosh, this bullet has, like, you know, the slipperest BC I've ever seen. Uh, this is going to be the perfect bullet for Wisconsin. Like, that may not be need to be on, like, the top of your list. Now, if yeah. you're trying to find, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be hunting here, but then I'm going to go hunt mule deer in Colorado in three weeks, then, you know, then maybe you want to try and choose something that's going to be good for, for both those applications. But, mm-hmm. I mean, Jason, what what are you looking at as far as, like, you know, <clears throat> the when to choose, the when to use kind of each style of these bullets that you just went through? Well, I think the the heavier the game the bigger heavier and tougher tougher the game the more important it is to have a bonded or monolithic bullet okay. it's going to have a higher weight retention and have that ability to break bones and go through heavier tissue and hide so if you're you know that's usually the kind of how i used how i put it in my own mind cuz i i tend to favor bonded bullets but i'll also shoot a game king you know every once in a while or or i've shot the burger hybrid hunter Mm-hmm. On, on lighter skin game. But as you get up into elk, moose, bear, um, anything, and you know, if you happen to get a chance to go to Africa and shoot some bigger game animals there, you definitely want to have a tougher construction bullet because you're typically also not going to shoot as far. So mm-hmm. you know, your, your long range expansion isn't as much of an issue. But then we did come up and I, I've kind of teased it a little bit, we came up with the terminal ascent, which we feel is the best all around bullet because it's built on that. It's got a copper, solid copper shank. It's got a lead core, but it's got a boat tail. It's got a a tip on it. We call the slip stream, Hmm. which is actually hollowed out on the inside so that uh, it's, it's a polymer tip that at high, at long range is hollow on the inside, which allows it, to um, expand even at those extreme distances oh, and initiate expansion because that's the challenge at long range. How do you get a really heavy constructed bullet right. to open up? And that uh, hollow tip for us is what does the trick. Right. Yeah, that makes sense because you are relying on a mechanical, like you said earlier, operation to open it up, and that mechanical operation requires a certain amount of force. So I can't imagine what uh, what it would be like to be one of the engineers behind that, figuring out the... Because I know that there's a certain amount of energy that needs to be present there in order to initiate that. And they got to calculate all that out. I know that's some of the stuff you usually get on the box of ammo when you buy it, is what amount of energy it needs in order to expand it. Um, that's got to be a heck of a calculation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and a lot of trial and error. You know, it's, it's I'm a lot sure. of just trigger time which is part of why people who work here love to shoot, you know, because mm-hmm. you get to, you, even when you're working, you get to pull the trigger. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, sometimes it's pretty arduous, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun overcoming those challenges. You know, we, that terminal ascent bullet was, you know, just a lot of time spent borrowing the greatest features from the best bullets out there. And, and we feel like we've got a bullet that holds, holds enough weight at close range to get through any kind of heavy barriers and stay together, but also has that ability to expand at, you know, eight, 900 yards if you were to shoot that far. Hmm. Not that we recommend that, but that's the testing that we've done. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, you always want to, I guess, like with anything. That's always the you caveat, you over, to say. You yeah. got to caveat it. Yeah. And, uh, and it, but also be kind of like overprepared, right? I yeah. think, I think that's, uh, you know, if you can, uh, you know, uh, just make sure uh, it's like, uh, the 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 Razor HD four thousand rangefinder. I'm probably not going to shoot four thousand yards, Jim. Oh, but I know it's going to perform exceptionally. You know, thousand yards and in for for my applications, which yes. are generally a thousand yards and in. So, and that bullet sounds super cool. I mean, it really sounds kind of like <clears throat> you know the magic bullet because I feel like yeah, maybe earlier when I said people rarely find a bullet that they can just live with for the rest of their life. Maybe I was wrong. Yeah, maybe we found the magic bullet. But, I mean, that is, like, that's always the challenge, right? It's like um, I've personally shot some bullets that, you know, 
are probably maybe more intended for for long, you know, quote long range hunting or you know, you know, executing longer range shots on game. You know, high BC, they're going to expand at longer ranges. But I've seen some interesting things happen um, at those closer ranges, right? And so you're like, oh man, you know. So well, now I'm going to switch to maybe this monolithic bullet, and you're like, well, that's great. Uh, but now I'm kind of like trying to extend my effective range and, you know, maybe there's some, some compromises that, that you're making there. So, I mean, this kind of really does sound like, like you said, you've kind of borrowed a lot of these great things from different styles of bullets and, uh, kind of, I guess, maximizing, uh, those positive attributes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've talked to some folks that have used that exact bullet that you're talking about and seen, you know, had some, some really solid success with it. So, what do the weights end up looking like on those bullets? Because I know if you look at a monolithic bullet, usually for caliber, it will appear quite light in the uh, you know as far as how many grains it is, and that's just because it's it its length is the length that you need it in order to you know fit cartridge overall length and for the loading and whatever and seat depth. But just because of the fact that it's just that one solid alloy and not lead, it makes it lighter even though it's still a pretty substantial size bullet. So what does it look like in those particular uh, projectiles? We're not as light as your, as your monolithic bullets, but it is on the lighter side because mm. you've got a bullet that's going to retain 90 to 95% of its weight. Yeah. Wow. So we don't have to start that much uh, heavier. So, I, you know, I just shot a 270 um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was 136 grains. Okay. And our six five is one hundred and thirty, so okay, not not cool. overly heavy, but um, you know, a lot left over. I mean, they're pretty close to that exact weight uh, when you pull them out of the animal. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of earlier, the amount of energy that it takes to get one of these expanded or expanding, you know, beginning the process. Um, that's something that I only just recently was told to uh, start paying attention to in terms of looking at a ballistic solution uh, that, you know, I got when I go through the zeroing process, you look at your environment as you look at this, that, and the other thing, and, and it spits out, you know, how much drop you're going to have at um, varying distances. And I always just thought, well, you know, that's kind of the main thing that a ballistics calculator is used for. I get that. I'm good, you know. And then, essentially, the bullet that leaves the barrel is just like this magical, you know, killing rock that as soon as it touches an animal, yep, it's good at any distance or whatever. Um, not that I'll shoot an animal at any distance, but at any distance that I'm willing to shoot at the animal with my own skill set. Uh, but somebody so kindly pointed out that a lot of ballistic solutions you get will even point out how much energy the bullet should have at each given distance. And so if you're a shooter who, and I know, I know many, and it's, it's, and I, you brought up the caveat earlier, you know, you test rounds out to 800 yards or so and it's not that we recommend that um and that's certainly shooter to shooter some people's maximum range they feel comfortable to is 200 yards some people i've seen them shoot long range hunting it's a thing um but uh if you're trying to figure out how far you can shoot and still make an ethical shot and see and have that bullet expand and do what it has to do you can see the uh the chart for energy that the bullet will have down range on most ballistics solutions i don't know if every single one but i know the ones that i was looking at like applied ballistics of, and whatnot all the ones i've used and and actually you know dovetailing into that jason it seems at least you know what i've heard over the years is you know folks say oh you know you want to have a thousand foot pounds of energy left you know to make sure that you have proper bull expansion and we're talking about a, a vast array of, of different bullets here so like is that just kind of like a, a catch-all thing that folks hear as far as um like the the appropriate amount of, of energy needed uh, to to you know I guess you know um, like we talk you know ethically dispatch a big game big game animal um, that that thousand foot pound threshold or does that does that vary as well depending on on the style of bullet? I think it's a good general benchmark to use, but yeah, it, it varies. And that, it's really about you know how penetration too. I mean, you have to get through enough. Of that animal's body to get to the vital zone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as the energy gets lower, you're just not going to be able to, to, to get there. And, and, and if you do, you know, sometimes they won't expand at long range. It'll actually poke all the way through. Okay. Um, gotcha. And, and won't, you know, create enough trauma. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean that's that's a pretty good number to use to be safe, but yeah, it varies. It's hard to say absolutely this is the number you have to to pinpoint. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's cool. Man, it's all uh, super, super interesting stuff. Like I say, we always, we're always we constantly debating here, and everybody's got their personal preference, and I think sometimes that just gets defined by, like, I had success with this, like, several mm-hmm. times. Like, it seems to be working, and I, I mean, I've been there. Like, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but I also like trying new things. So, yeah. you know, you're going through the different bullets there. I mean, I've, I've, your trophy copper, I've killed uh, animals with that, the Swift Scirocco, the Burger Hybrid. Uh, the Nosler Acubond, the Acubond LRs, uh, man, ton, tons of different, I mean, like, I, they all seem to work pretty good, and I think it's just, you know, maybe just doing your research and, and deciding, okay, you know, I mean, a lot of what we've talked about here is predicated on, okay, what animal am I hunting? You know, how big is that animal? What is that animal's bone structure like? Uh, does that animal bite back? Uh, Get, what what uh, <laughs> what shots may I get presented with? What shots do I want to be pre- prepared for? Um, you know, what is the average distance of my shot? These are all things to be thinking about. You know, when you're you know picking a cartridge, I guess to begin with, and then also you know the, your bolt selection to yeah. that you're going to be pushing through that rifle. What uh, I'll throw this out there and and maybe make myself look silly, but you know I think this is, this is where people get to ask all kinds of questions, and so. One thing I hear people discuss, people who, people who have shot more game than I have, is um, you hear them discuss, oh, well, I shot this bullet and it, it failed me. Or it really didn't do well. Um, it didn't perform the way it was supposed to. And sometimes that happens, and probably the most easy way to tell if a bullet didn't do what it was supposed to is if you very clearly, and you, and you know it, hit it, and never found it. It got it. It got off. You search for it everywhere, and it just it didn't it didn't work. It didn't put it down. Uh, but sometimes people have killed an animal, and it's it's there, and they say, "Oh well, it still didn't perform the way that I I wanted it to." What are some characteristics that would of you know of the final scene that you have there uh, that would cause somebody to go through and say, "Oh, based on what I'm seeing here in front of me." Uh, it could have performed better or, or done its job differently. Are there, um, is it, you know, once you start getting the quarters off and when you, once you start peeling the hide back, are you seeing just like it looks more like a pinhole all the way through instead of a big giant cloud of a lot of carnage? Gel- or? Gelatinous mess. Yeah, what, how, would you, how would you know really well whether or not a bullet worked? Assuming that it it did kill it again, like I said, assuming it's not that it just ran off, then you probably should know. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, you know, some our, we don't coach this, but some of our guys have been at shows, and and people come up and show them a bullet and say, "I pulled this out of an animal. It, you know, it didn't work." And he's like, "What? What did you say? You pulled it out of the <laughs> <laughs> so, It was quite a tussle. Quite a tussle. <laughs> I I politely uh, asked for it back. (laughs) Yeah, no, but it's, yeah, I mean, no products, you know, we've, especially as we test different velocities, you know, we've, we've seen bullets do some goofy things. And, um, but I think the most common thing that people look for is if they find the bullet, does it look like you showed them in the catalog? So, you know, oftentimes, especially when monolithic bullets first came out, they'll shed petals because it's a pretty hard, uh, copper. Pretty so brittle. If it hits a bone, you'll, you'll lose a couple of petals and it'll come out and you'll say it doesn't look like it should, but it still did its job. Um, but yeah, I think internal trauma is tough. I mean, you, you can usually tell when, when there's been a lot of trauma, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but it's tough to, to really measure that in terms of, you know, this, this is better than that trauma. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a squishy answer to your question, but that's okay. <laughs> it's it's tell, possibly you know, literally. It's okay. Way. That's okay. Yeah, cause, yeah. Yeah. Cause I figured it would be a little bit of a difficult question and maybe, maybe even a slightly dumb question, but I know I've just heard that from so many people where they're like, Oh yeah, well, you know, the bullet didn't perform the way I wanted it to. And then like you said, you're like, well, the animal's dead. Right. So how, 
what did you <laughs> what did you expect? You know, I mean, but I can th- I can think of an instance when like I kind of had an an interesting situation like that where I was kind of like, huh? And I think you kind of you know I'd say because of the style of bolts that I gravitate towards, like you expect kind of like maybe a certain type of performance or a certain thing to happen, you know, and so. This was actually... So like how the wound cavity looks, maybe? Or how the end bullet looks when you pull it out? Or just... Um, or the fact that you even found a bullet in general? Or uh, may- maybe any of those things. But I guess in this particular case, you know, I was shooting a bullet that was, you know, it was a hunting bullet, but it was designed for, you know, long-range application as well. I ended up getting uh, a, a pretty close-range shot. Again, like 80 yards in the timber. This is a, a different deer than that other one. Uh, shot the buck... He walked uphill, turned around, and uh, I about squeezed it off. He took another couple steps, stopped, and then I shot him again. He ran down the hill, and he tipped over, right? So, like, end result, got him. Like, really, that's all that matters. Sure. But the interesting thing is, and I guess, unfortunately, and I, I can't say that it didn't perform how I wanted to, I guess, in its entirety, because just because of circumstances, timing, and where we're at, we ended up taking it to a butcher. So they did, like, the final, I guess, you know, they got to do kind of, like, the heavy post-mortem. But just upon, like, really kind of basic inspection after field dressing the animal, like, I really couldn't find an entrance hole. And then I only found, like, one, like, really random exit hole. But it was, like, super low in in the bottom, I guess, of, like, almost near the, the stomach cavity, but way low. And it was just kind of like this bizarre phenomenon. I'm like, I know I hit this buck twice. Like, I hit him twice. Like, I watched him react to both shots. Yeah. And yet, the only hole I found was a very small exit hole on the offside of of the animal. I just and so, like I said, he tipped over. You know. Yeah. He did soak up two pills at 80 yards too. I don't know. It was like kind of weird. And I, I mean, really, too much to speculate. And like I said, I didn't even get to. Uh, I didn't even end up skinning the buck out. You know, we got got him field dressed and off we went, and you know, took him took him away. So you know, took took the easy route. But it just it kind of left some questions in my mind, I guess. You know. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point, Mark. I mean, especially if you have to shoot twice, then you've got twice as many opportunities to see how the bullet performed. And you know, we will see if if a bullet's of lighter construction and it it hits the shoulder and doesn't penetrate through. You can see that mm-hmm. when you butcher it. Um, you know, on occasion that you'll have a, a standard cup and core bullet that won't expand right. It'll uh, it'll just kind of look like a banana almost, and you'll have a pinhole on the other side. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so if if you have to shoot multiple times or the animal runs off, then those are you know, obvious indicators of of something went wrong. And and then you have to just sometimes it's it's speculation. If you find the bullet, you can see that it didn't behave like it was supposed to, and you can contact the manufacturer and. You know, if it was one of ours, of course, we'll always, um, you know, be responsive and try to do some testing and see what went wrong. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Oh, I can tell you that that trophy, I, th- I think it was your trophy copper that I shot at that other buck at close range. And, man, like I said, that thing, that did, that hit, it hit a, you know, a very massive bone in that rear ham. I mean, it hit in, in kind of the, the meat of that bone. And like I said, that obviously wasn't my intent to hit it there. But, man, it continued driving through that 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 deer perfectly and i mean it went down in super short order but yeah you know and and i think another thing to at least when i think of you know bullet performance i I think just because um something doesn't tip over immediately doesn't mean that that bullet didn't perform famously right i mean i think you think or maybe you see in the movies like you know something gets shot and you know they just tip over and even though i mean it's a massive transfer of energy um they're not always going to tip over, but the bullet performed exactly how it was intended. So they're mm-hmm. not always just going to tip over. They might, you know, run 50 yards. They might run 100 yards. Um, but uh, I, I think for somebody who they're, you know, not not, a, not everybody, but I think some people might have the expectation that, like, oh, for it to perform, perform properly, I need to park that animal right there. And that just doesn't always happen. Yeah. yeah and sometimes, well, the, that, that's another great point. Sometimes I've noticed with smaller diameter bullets being pushed really fast, mm-hmm. you know, you don't always hear the impact on the game. Oh, okay. And you guys have probably shot enough that if you shoot a 338 uh, bullet or even a 30 cal, sometimes you hear it just flop the side of the animal. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, thwop is a you good don't word always hear it to use. What's that? I said thwop is a good word to use. It almost literally it really makes is the descriptor of the sound. <laughs> thwop. 
Yeah. And, and so that's, I mean, that's an indication that I, I hit that animal. I know I did. Um, but I, you don't always hear that depending on what cartridge and caliber you're using. So again, you can't judge, you know, one, one effect, your one impact uh, or one, one sound or one sight can't always be the indicator for how well, you know, your shot did. Yeah. Trophy bonded bear claw. I've shot a few animals with those too. They work really well. Most of these, Jim, out of the venerable 300 short mag. Oh, WSM, no doubt. I should say. No doubt. You didn't call it the wisdom. Those just, Texans got I didn't, to you. I didn't want to upset the... I, I talk about the 300 sh- Winchester short mag <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> I don't even know which one to say peep, now. The, 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 and then we always call it the 300 wisdom. And then, but the, the, as, and I love Texas and I love the people of Texas and they get a little bit, they don't like that. I don't know why. We should ask. You've upset them. I have very much. Well, what, I shoot at 270 Wisdom quite a bit, Mark. So, an, another very underrated cartridge, in my personal opinion. It worked I, well for me. I was going to ask. That's, that was one of my questions. I don't, I don't know if it'll be my parting question. It was going to be maybe be, but what is that? What's your go to all around? Killing stick cartridge is that is it the 270 wisdom something else lately i've been shooting 270 wisdom quite a bit but i've got a 6.5 creed more and you know the hype is real it's a good cartridge mm-hmm. uh 30 out six still love that one you know I, that was my very first deer i shot with 30 out six and hard to beat that one and if you're in wisconsin or minnesota where we are a lot of deer have been killed with 30 30s so oh yeah it was just kind of a classic cartridge but yeah, I think I've lately I've been shooting that 270 short mag quite a bit, and um, you know I'll, I'll expand my horizons. I I love to do that and test different cartridges. So maybe a 65 PRC is next, or mm. seven seven Psalm is kind of a fun one oh. throwback cartridge. Oh yeah, I like both those. What uh, what bullet are you using out of your 270 Wisdom mostly? That Terminal Ascent. I've really, oh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Great results with that one. I've I've tried a number of different products and had success with many, but Terminal Ascent is the one I've really settled on because I've been able to make shots out to 400 yards thanks to great optics and and good ballistics data. But um, you know, you can also use it at close range and not have to worry about it coming apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, man, you bring up target shooting again. It just reminds me of like what flashed into my head was the fact that, you know, when you shoot at steel versus when you shoot at game, it just, it's so much more, there's so much more or so many more complexities when it comes into shooting a game that go into it. You know, I mean, you ring steel, you hit it anywhere. That's good enough. That'll pass. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I love doing that. But when it comes to shooting an animal, it, it does get, uh, does get more complicated. I mean, we were talking with Ryan Lampers a little bit ago mm-hmm. and he was bringing up, um, you know, you, you talk about getting the bullet there and being accurate with it, and then you talk about the terminal ballistics, but then also where you're placing the shot, too. I mean, he's explaining where he's placed in shot. He's not necessarily trying to bust up a lot of bone and because he's hunting for getting as much meat as he can. He doesn't want to lose that front yep. quarter. So, yeah, he was saying he tries to be really, really picky and patient with, you know, mm-hmm. with his shots, and if he needs to wait a little bit, he'll wait a little bit. I'm not sure I'm... As patient, but it seems yeah. like a lot of those opportunities are fleeting or you've got a short window or a gap or, you know, I don't know. There's a lot going. They're not always just standing in the white. I'm not saying they are for him either. He's pretty, he is a fantastic hunter, but. Yeah. But yeah, then that shot placement comes into play and, uh, and it gets, it gets complicated too when you throw adrenaline in the mix. Tell you what, I mean, mm-hmm. it seems to be nothing, uh, nothing a critter on earth can't do without a little shot of adrenaline. Yeah, going through their veins. So, uh, yeah. And even if you get in the most steady shooting position, right, you get prone. I've had rocks and sticks jabbing me in the ribs. I mean, it's just, it's different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hard to get that perfect positioning. That yep. it is. That yeah. it is. Perfect positioning, rock sticks, you know, getting good support, you know, wind. We didn't even talk about wind. I mean, there's just so many variables that, you know, are going to affect your shot. And obviously you don't want to take a shot unless you're confident you're going to, you know, that bullet's going to get where you want it to go, you know, within reason. But, um, yeah, a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that goes into it. I'm sure even long after this podcast, we're going to continue talking about all these same things forever. It's the truth. And that's part of the beauty of it, though. 
like like Jason said earlier, that's that's part of the fun is like when you are kind of you know a, a fanatic, you know about hunting and shooting and bullets. There's just the debate really is endless. But hopefully this conversation has shed some light and a little bit of clarity on you know what a person might want to be thinking about when uh, when they're uh, selecting a bullet. That's the truth for their next hunt. We like to say, and obviously we we do ammo, and all we do is ammo. Um, the bullet is the only thing, only piece of equipment that actually touches the animal. You know, guns get all the, the <laughs> guns are sexy. Guns get all the credit and, and they're wonderful. I, I love guns. We all do. Right. But the bullet is the one thing that's your link to that meat. That, that's a good way a to very good point. It really kind of <laughs> brings it into perspective there. All that work, all that equipment, all that money is spent just to get that one little projectile to hit just the right spot. And it, and it makes sense to put, I mean, we put so much time and effort and money and planning into these trips. Um, you know, the ammo and the bullet that you select shouldn't be an afterthought. Mm-hmm. That's that's for sure. And I think for for most people, that's not the case. But uh, it really is. Like you said, I mean, that is that is the direct link for sure. So... Make yeah. sure it's going to work how you want it to. Jason, any, any any final thoughts? Anything we didn't cover? Questions we should have asked? Cool stuff going on with you guys? Stuff we should keep our eyes peeled for that you shouldn't talk about, but you'll talk about on the podcast here with us? <laughs> uh, I mean, we do have, you know, I talked a lot about Terminal Ascent, but we also have what we're calling the Custom Shop. It's available on our website where you can go on, and if you want to try different bullets or cartridges that are non-standard for us, you yeah. can go on and, and from a list of certain cartridges, you know, we, we have to load to certain pressures, so you can't choose your velocity necessarily, mm. but um, you can choose different projectiles that we don't offer in our standard catalog, Cool, which, which has been fun. We've, and not only in rifle, also in shot shell, uh, we've got actually a lot of interest in our TSS loads oh. and, and people are buying those in sub gauges and having them custom built for them. Uh, we've got a small shop within the big factory where guys do it all by hand and it's really fun to to watch them do that and to see the you know what people are asking for. That's actually really awesome. That's super cool. Have there been have there been any uh I guess you know uh loadings from your customers that you guys are like, "Hmm. That's a good one." Well, the um ten, we're surprised at how much 10 gauge we're selling um in TSS oh, for, for really shotgun shells, yeah. So people are are uh they love that tungsten shot, and it it does a number on birds. It it really is magic. I I killed. Uh, well, I hunted with it for the first time this last spring, and and shot two birds with it, and both were. I mean, I guess they weren't exceptionally far, but I bet one was like forty forty five ish, and the other one was probably about um, I don't know thirty yards, something like that. But I mean, it was. It it did exactly what you'd want it to do. I mean, it, it rolled those birds, and you know there there weren't any questions. <laughs> no questions. Well, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the reason we came out with that shot is to make stub gauges more effective. So yeah, you know, we, a lot of people are ordering four ten TSS, mm-hmm. which which is fun to see, and it's a, it's fun to shoot too. I mean, it is. I mean, talk about, I mean, you know, in states where it's legal. And I, I think, um, are, are more and more states allowing be kind of because of these developments, you know, the 410 to be used during, during that turkey season? They, they are. And that's been, that's what's great about our industry is that we've got these connections, you know, to the states and we can actually demonstrate to them, look, it, you know, these smaller pellet sizes are effective when you're talking about a really dense tungsten material. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. we've, you know, in fact, I had a chance to shoot a 410 on Turkey in Oregon um, when they had, it, Boardman, I think you were going to be on that hunt with us. Uh, yeah. I can't remember what happened. Something catastrophic <laughs> where I actually, I might've had a good excuse. I think I might've been bear hunting on, on Prince of Wales Island. So. Yes. Okay. That, that passes. But yeah, we, we shot 410 and, and uh, the guy I, I went and sighted my gun in it at a resident's house nearby. And he said, can you actually use that legally here? And I showed him on the site. Yeah, they just passed it this year. Cool. So yeah, we've had great results with states nice. reacting to trends. And, you know, as long as they're, they're still ethical means of killing, you know, and you can demonstrate that. Mm-hmm. 
That's well, cool. Yeah, I mean, not as with, you know, with bullets or you know, shot or whatever. I mean, you guys are obviously working on these things uh, all the time. Technologies are developing, new processes are developing, engineering is developing, um, and it's cool to see you know those state agencies you know adapt along with that. And somehow, as much as I I'm, I live this big game centric lifestyle and 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 think about deer, sometimes somehow Jim, we're always able to just circle back up and talk about turkey hunting because. It really is super fun. So, oh, totally. I uh, got one last question for you. We, you mentioned it was right before we got to casting here uh, that obviously, and a, and a lot of people just know this, but it's been pretty crazy in terms of trying to find ammo these days. Uh, but you mentioned that it's not just the typical two twenty three, five five six, and nine millimeter that's flying off shelves. It's also a lot of hunting cartridges, which goes to show there's more people than ever trying to get out and get hunting. So I'm wondering, uh, let's say somebody says, hey, this year I want to try getting a gun uh, and then going out and hunting. Are there any little hidden gem cartridges out there that somebody might find a uh, factory rifle chambered in where there's good ammo available for it and maybe it's not like the most popular ammo ever that you might not be able to find anywhere, but like it's kind of popular enough that you will find it somewhere? I know Mark is already thinking, well, it already exists. 300 Win- Winchester yeah. Short Man. I actually decided I'm not going to keep bringing that up because <laughs> um, it's only going to end up hurting myself, Jim. But. Any uh, any other ones that uh, that aren't Mark's favorite? Well, I mean, we, we have gotten to a point where we're making quite a bit of 6.5 Creed more, so we tend to have a good supply of that coming Oh, nice. Out. Okay. But, you know, I mentioned we introduced the Swift Scirocco line and the 270 WSM. Okay. Is available. I see that one come up a lot on our on our tracking sheet, and um, 280 Ackley improved, mm. which has kind of gotten hot again. It's an older cartridge that's come back, had a resurgence. We we've built that this year, and there's a fair amount of that product available, and that's a that's seven rem mag performance out of a lighter recoiling uh, platform. It's pretty cool. Heck yeah. That is super cool. I know Ryan is a fan of that 280 AI. He is. He is. That's some good tips right there. That's also a cartridge that we get a ton of requests for to do uh, some 10-minute talks on. So um, I like it. Good info. Jason, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time. I'm sure I'll think about of about 20 other questions uh, that I didn't ask like right after we jump off here. But, um, yeah, all good information. Yes. I uh, appreciate you guys having me on. It's, it's always fun to talk shop and – Use your products, really enjoy them. So keep doing what you're doing too. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. No, thank you. Yeah. And thanks everybody for listening out there too. Like we said, uh, this was one that we have gotten some suggestions on. So hopefully this answered some questions out there. And if you have any other things related to terminal ballistics, definitely let us know. Maybe we can uh, maybe we can bring the crew from Federal on again or uh, or address anything else too. We love talking about this kind of stuff. So um, yeah, appreciate it. Other than that. As you like to say, Jim, happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Yes, and then followed by bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.